Hey, good morning, everybody that's here in person. Good morning, everybody that's joining us online. We're glad that you could be here this morning. So I don't know if you heard the news, but uh, aliens, they're real, guys. Did you hear that? So there's a former Israeli um, chief security space guy, I forget his title, who says there's a whole galactic federation of aliens. Uh, they've got a secret underground base on Mars. Trump knows all about it. So uh, they're just waiting for us to grow up, and then they'll come say hey. So is it true? I don't know. I don't personally think so. But it wouldn't be the weirdest thing to happen this year, let's be honest. It's been one of those years where a lot of crazy stuff has happened all at once. You know, you've got peace in the Middle East developing. Nobody thought that would ever happen. You've got a global pandemic, this virus that shut down the whole world economy. That's weird. We've got nation, national unrest happening in our borders. We've got government overreach. It's the end of time, some people are saying. And maybe they're right. I don't know. All I know is this has been a whirlwind of a year. The world's kind of in a rough spot right now. You know? And, and it's in times like this where we need joy. And I, I don't mean just like Christmas cheer or holiday spirit. I mean real joy, that kind of joy that won't quit, that's too stubborn to go away or bend its knee just because the world's a little dim or darker in rough shape. And that's the kind of joy we've been talking about in this series the last few weeks called the audacity of joy. How dare that joy show up when everybody's supposed to be depressed? But that's the kind of assurance we have available to us in this thing we call the gospel. And we've been looking at that joy and the songs that are sung in the Christmas story, in the book of Luke, here at the beginning of, of this tale. And when we look at these songs, what we see is there is this audacious kind of joy that just won't disappear, even when their world was in kind of a rough spot. That's something we can relate to and draw from. And today we're looking at another one of those songs. This time it's sung by a group of angels. It's sung, uh, found rather in the book of Luke, chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open those up to Luke, chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles with you, you can always follow along on the screens to the side, or as always, download the FCC Mammoth app to your mobile device. You can click the Sunday button in the bottom right-hand corner, and you'll find a lot of different tools that are pretty useful for getting a lot out of our morning together. The most useful right now is going to be called Sermon Notes. It's got our passage pulled up and a bunch of notes that you can follow along with and even reference and make use of later in the week as you go back and kind of reflect on our message today. So, Luke chapter 2, this is probably what we think of as the original Christmas story. Like when you tell the story of baby Jesus in the manger, you think of Mary and Joseph traveling to Bethlehem. This is it. This is where we find it. And what we see is that even in the Christmas story, we see that the world yeah, wasn't in the best shape for people. The Christmas story took place at a time when the world was in a bit of a tough spot, especially if you were Jewish. Now, for some people, everything was great. If you were Roman or if you were willing to bow down and worship the emperor as a god, you probably thought life was pretty swell during this time period of history. But if you refused to bend your knee to that man, or if you had any aspirations of national independence whatsoever, you weren't real happy with the state of the world at this time. And we start to see a little bit of that tension, even in this Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, let's start in verse 1. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. So like I said, even in the details of this really familiar story, we get to see the, the glimpse of kind of the situation that their world was in at this point. And from the opening words, we get the picture that this wasn't exactly the greatest time period for some people. Caesar Augustus, the Caesar of the entire empire, said everybody has to take a census. And this census was almost definitely for the purposes of taxation. Everybody in this region of the world was already heavily overtaxed, but he wanted to make sure he was leveling the appropriate level of crushing financial burden, because he's a swell guy like that. 
So that's the situation. And to make this even more complicated, you couldn't just mail in, you know, here's my details. You couldn't go online and fill it out. You apparently had to travel to certain locations based upon your family of origin and where records were kept and so on. And so Joseph, given his family background, has to travel from the town of Nazareth to the town of Bethlehem. It's about a 90-mile journey. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you have to do things on foot or at best on the back of an animal, that's a little bit of a stretch. So because his fiance, his betrothed Mary, is far along, we don't know how exactly or how far along her pregnancy she is exactly, probably the last trimester somewhere in there, she comes along with him. She is seven, eight, maybe nine months pregnant, traveling 90 miles on foot or at best on the back of an animal. Ladies, you know that's not going to be fun, right? You're going to have a lot of things, rightfully, to complain about. Fellas, can you imagine going on a 90-mile trip with your pregnant wife through a, not paved streets, by the way, rough hills and terrain, braving the elements? Can you imagine the number of complaints, rightful complaints, but complaints nonetheless you will listen to for the entirety of the journey. This is not going to be fun for anybody, but they had to do it. They had to because the government said, you have to go to this place and register. The journey itself kind of reminds me of this story, a girl named Lynzette Perez. She was a, a marathon runner. And she actually qualified for the Boston Marathon. That was her dream was to complete that. And about a week after qualifying, she found out she was pregnant. Now, like I said, this was her dream. She'd been training for this. You don't just wake up one day and think, yeah, I'm going to run a marathon. She'd been working at this for months and months and months. And she wasn't ready to just let go of all of that. So she decided she was going to try to run the Boston Marathon while she was pregnant. That's 26.2 some odd miles. So she did the responsible thing. She checked in with doctors and physicians the day the marathon came, and she ran. She completed it. Now, she had to stop and pee every 20 minutes, but she got to the finish line of that marathon. And when they, she crossed that line, she was interviewed. She said, yeah, even my doctors and my parents thought I was nuts. I can't imagine why, right? Nine months pregnant, 26.2 miles. That sounds so crazy. Mary had to go 90 miles, almost three times as far. And again, she didn't have a choice. They didn't have a lot of power over their own lives. The government said, you have to do this. Can you imagine what the reaction would be today if the government said, you're seven, eight, nine months pregnant. I want you to travel 90 miles on foot so that you can pay the proper amount of income tax. We don't even like the government telling us we have to wash our hands and wear masks. That's not going to go over real well, right? But again, they did not have a choice. They had very little power over their own lives. This was the world that they lived in. It was not a great time for the Jewish people. So they travel and they get to Bethlehem and they probably stay at a relative's house or a, a family associate. It's a very hospitable culture. It's a very common thing. Sometimes we tell this story, we, we imagine there was like a Best Western or something at, at Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a very small town. There probably wasn't a formal inn like that. And so they stayed in a guest room, a family room, a large room that would have been available to them. And they apparently weren't the only ones because there seemed to be a lot of other people there, so much so that when time came for the baby to be born, there just wasn't room, there wasn't privacy, they couldn't spread out. It, you know, we, again, we sometimes get this image of that mean innkeeper looking at this pregnant woman in labor saying, nope, not in my house, get out. That probably didn't happen. This was a very hospitable culture. More likely, Mary and Joseph just required some more room because of overcrowding. Again, this census brought a big influx of people into a very small community. This was a result of the government thumb being on them. And so they went to, maybe it was a stable attached to the house. There's an ancient tradition from the second century. says they went to a cave nearby. That makes sense because oftentimes that's where they pinned up the animals. Regardless of the circumstance, this was not a nice, warm, cozy, comfortable place. It was cold. It was dark. It was dirty. It may have been damp given the time of year. It's not the backdrop that we imagine for this tender moment of, of this young family becoming a, you know, bringing a child into this world. It's, it's not that. It's rather frustrating. And it was entirely a result of the world that they lived in. This was not a great time in history if you were among God's people. And yet even still, even in a messy world like this, there came a reason for audacious joy. 
We read about that as the story continues. If you look at verse 8, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So there's some shepherds nearby, probably relatively nearby, out in the fields watching over their sheep. And these angels show up and scare the crud out of them. They're oh my gosh, angels. That'd be a little disturbing. And the angel says, don't worry about it. I have good news of great joy. Now, good news was in short supply in this world. So that was welcomed. And this news, it isn't just like kind of good news. It isn't news that will bring a moderate amount of, of happiness or cheer. It is good news of great joy. And the New Testament, if you're not familiar, it was written in Greek originally. That Greek word for great Megalane. That's where we get our English word for mega. I bring you good news of mega joy, not a small thing. This was going to be huge news. This was going to be something for everybody. This was an audacious level of joy that was going to be coming into this world. So what was this good news? There was a child born, and this child would be a savior. He would be the Messiah, which means he was God's chosen one. He is the Lord, which is to say he is the true and rightful king. And all of these three titles, they speak of who Jesus is, but they also say something about what he was going to do. Those titles speak to his accomplishment, what his life would result in, what it would demonstrate. This child was going to grow and work salvation in this world. He was going to rescue people from the mess that's something that people desperately yearned for. And that's probably the best bridge we can build between that story from 2,000 years ago and our lives today. Because when our world is a mess, what we all really yearn for is somebody to rescue us. Something spectacular to happen that will make significant change. They yearned for it then, and there were way too many people this year that yearned for it now. Every year, Gallup uh, does a poll, does a survey of the nation just to gauge its mental health. And it's a survey that takes all year. They ask intermittently at different points of the year, but in no November is usually when they finalize it, put their conclusions together. You probably wouldn't be shocked to learn that among those people who said they had excellent mental health, they found that the numbers hit a 20-year low in 2020. Not since the well, early 2000s, did we have such, I don't want to say despair, that's a little too dramatic, but such a decline in mental health. And there's a lot of things that are suspected to have contributed to that. The most obvious is the pandemic and the lockdowns that came, the isolation that resulted from all of that. Then there was unrest in our nation, all across our nation, for a significant time period this year that caused some turmoil and some angst. There was, oh, the survey, by the way, took place right before the election, which was probably bad for everybody's morale and mental health. There's just a lot of things that kind of came together to create this cloud that hung over this year, and, and people were frustrated, people were depressed, they were anxious. Many people were afraid, or at the very best, nervous about what the future would hold. That's understandable. A lot of crazy stuff happened this year. And what people really were looking for was something to happen, something to, to lift the cloud, something spectacular that would make a significant change. Now, there's some really interesting data when you start to break this survey down by demographics. You start to see this really fascinating detail. Every single demographic group saw declines in their excellent overall mental health. It really didn't matter if it was men or women. It didn't matter your age. It didn't matter your political affiliation. It didn't matter your income level. It, you know, all of these things, it didn't really matter. Everybody saw declines. The majority, by the way, of these categories saw double-digit declines. So not just a little bit of depression, but a lot of depression starting to seep into people's lives. All of these categories took a hit, except for one, interestingly enough. 
those who attended religious services weekly did not see or report seeing a decline in those reporting excellent mental health. In fact, it was the only category that saw an increase, 4%, over the last year. 4%. Now, I'm going to make some assumptions, given the United States and its demographic makeup, that the majority of those people that attend weekly religious services are probably Christian people. That is an assumption. I can't prove that, but I think that's a reasonable statement. So I have to start asking myself, what is it about these Christian people that attend church on a weekly basis that is different? Because we are made up of both men and women, of every race, of every marital status, of every income level, of every age. There's nothing different about us from anybody else in this nation. So why is it that this group of people saw an increase in excellent mental health. And the only conclusion that I can come to is that while everybody else was waiting for someone to rescue them from this messy year, we, we weren't. We already have a Savior. We're not looking for another one. And while everyone was waiting for something spectacular to make a significant change, we realized that it already happened. We already have good news of audacious, great, mega joy. This huge paradigm-shifting realization that God has worked something fantastic in this world. It's called the gospel. By the way, the, the word that the angel uses for good news, that is the Greek word for gospel. I have gospel for you, and it will be a cause of mega joy. And the data seems to show that. We have this news that Jesus came into this world. And the the thing that separates us, that eats away at our soul, that makes us feel empty and distant from God, what we call sin, has been forgiven. It's been washed away. That this chasm between us and, and our Creator has been bridged and we can come to Him. We have this news that we've been filled with new life through the very Spirit of God. We have this news that This king, this chosen one, has prepared a place for us in his coming kingdom. Our name is on the list. We have a reservation. We have this good news that we are promised victory over every trial, over every global pandemic, even over the grave itself, and that he has verified his ability to deliver and save by overcoming his own death and his own grave. It is good news of great, mega, audacious joy that is worth celebrating and worth standing on even when our world seems like it's in a mess. There is no rough patch rough enough to undo the good news that we call the gospel. And the gospel is such good news that even heaven rejoices along with us. We read that as the story continues. Look at Luke chapter 2 and verse 13. We have these angels show up, say, I got good news of great joy. And then it says, suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is our song. This is the OG Christmas carol. This is the one the angels sang. It's one that we imitated and echoed in that previous song that we sang just before I got up here. And it's praise and it's worship to God for what he has done. Even when the world was dark and dim, when there was unrest, when people had very little power over their lives, when everything seemed like it was just a mess, God spoke, he sent his son to bring a savior and a deliverer. Praise God for what he's done. The part that's really interesting for you and me and the part that we can take with us today is what the angel goes on to say. On the earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. That would be mankind. Peace to you because God's favor, God's good will is upon you. What that means is is that God is not against us. Even though the world may seem like it's spinning out of control and there's so many unfortunate things happening, that's not this sign that God is somehow opposed to us. Quite the contrary. The coming of this child, Christ, into the world is God's testimony. I am for you. I'm in your corner. My favor is upon you. My good will, my intentions, my aspirations, my dreams, they are not contrary to you. They are for you. I want you to experience joy. I want you to experience health. I want you to experience bliss. I want you to experience me. That's God's message through the coming of Christ. 
He's not against us. He is in our corner, and he has our back. And it is an amazing comfort that should give us confidence and should give us hope and even stir up an audacious level of joy to know that somebody capable has got our back. It makes all the difference. There's a, think about it like this. In 2006, somewhere in an undisclosed location in Iraq, there was an Army Staff Sergeant, Brett Johnson. He was leading a, a small squad of soldiers through a town in Iraq towards a house under the cover of night. And in this house was a high priority target that needed to be secured. Now, Johnson knew that there were enemy combatants somewhere in the area, wasn't real sure where. And so they were moving slowly and cautiously. They were about to break around the corner of a building when all of a sudden they heard a whoosh and then a thud. And as they turned that corner, what they saw crumpled on the ground was an armed enemy combatant that had been neutralized, we'll say, with an AK-47 slumped down beside him. Now, Johnson had no idea that guy was there. And later when he tells this story, he says, if our sniper had not been there to watch our backs, that guy definitely would have shot one of us. It makes all the difference in the world having somebody capable in your corner who's watching out for you that has your back. It made a difference to those guys. They went home alive. They went home succeeding, having accomplished their mission. Things could have turned out very differently if that sniper hadn't been there watching their backs, but he was. And that's kind of an image of what we're talking about here. God is not sitting on a throne callously watching our world as it just spins into chaos and as it's in kind of this messy, rough patch. He has already worked. He has already spoken. He's already sent into this world a real Savior who has done something spectacular that has made all the difference. We're just waiting for the conclusion to unfold. We have every reason to have confidence, even though the world is spinning out of control. We have every reason to have hope and assurance in the promises of God because of what Jesus has done. We have every reason to celebrate and have a real, genuine, dare I say, audacious joy, even when everyone else feels like the world is a funk and in a mess. In a funk and is a mess. I should switch those prepositions. It doesn't matter if the world is falling apart. We might find ourselves at the mercy of some tyrannical dictator who gives zero power over our own lives the way that Mary and Joseph lived. We might find ourselves at the mercy of a global virus that fundamentally changes our way of life. We may find ourselves at the mercy of murder hornets and aliens. I can't even believe I have to say those things, but it's 2020. That's just the year that we live in. I just heard the other day that there's a black hole at the center of our universe that the earth is hurtling towards and, you know, in a few millennia we might actually get there. It's all bad news when you turn on the TV and you watch the news. It doesn't matter how bad it is or how much is out there. We have good news. And we can have a joy like no other because we have good news like no other. It's called the gospel. It's this sign that God is for us. He's in our corner. He is actually working with us. He's working for us. He has sent his son to save us, to guarantee us victory over this world and whatever problems it may have. And it is reason for us as his people to rejoice. And so here's what I want to encourage you to do. It's the week of Christmas. Inevitably, there's going to be some bad news. Maybe because of Christmas, they'll spare us. Regardless, I would encourage you to choose to rejoice to echo the song of these angels, to remember that God is worth praising because he has worked in our favor and is in our corner. Choose to rejoice and be reminded of the good news of the gospel that belongs to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for good news. In a world where good news is sometimes in short supply, we praise you and we rejoice in the confidence we can have because of you and your son, because of his coming, because of his victory, because of his imminent return. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to see in ever clearer ways how your favor and your goodwill work with us and are upon us. We have hard times. We are down. We feel depression just like everyone else. And yet we know, Father, that in the bigger picture of things, you have victory, that you've declared peace, that you've declared mercy and grace, and you have fulfilled all your promises to your people in Christ. And so we just wait. We wait 
for those things to unfold fully. We wait for those things to fill us to new degrees and new levels. And we wait for this king who came once to make his return, to set all things right, and to clean up a messy world. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.